So tonight, we're going to talk about Chapter 9. Does anybody know the radio observatory that I've got a picture of on the front? This is the... It says right there. It's a, it's a very large array in New Mexico. It's actually interesting because that's what's photographed on the front page of Chapter 9 of your textbook. And then it goes on to talk about uh, the discovery of the first pulsar, which is done with a radio telescope, but certainly not this radio telescope. It was a, a big British telescope. But I guess this one looks a little nicer in sunset photographs. So you can find it see as you come on in. I want to talk about what's going on with Master in Physics. There is a new homework that is due on Friday. Uh, hopefully you've seen this. It's on Chapter 9 stuff that we're going to be talking about for this two hours. Um, I have also, as I tend to do, I've posted uh, a set of optional videos that you can watch that I thought were, were pretty nice. Uh, we've got Buzz Cut Guy comes back. He's going to do the same thing as me. He spins himself around in a chair, gets super dizzy. Uh, plus, there's yet another white guy. <laughs> and there's also two of these uh, Khan Academy uh, style videos in which they go through in detail solving a chapter 9 style problem in a, in a nice way, I think. And like I say, hopefully there's seat, enough seats available for everyone who's coming in. <laughs> and if not, my technologists have said that they will eventually set up an overflow. So while we're on the subject of yet another white guy, I thought I would just say a well, word. I happen to be on the, um, the inclusivity committee in the physics department uh, that tries to, uh, you know, encourage recruitment and retention and career development of um, everyone who wants to study physics. Uh, one of the things that we deal with in physics is uh, lack of gender diversity, and so which you probably noticed, but it's. It's sort of getting better at a very sort of glacial rate. The, the tick marks here are, are decades, in fact. And so if you go back to like the 1960s, about 5%, 6% of uh, the bachelor's degrees in physics were, were women. That's kind of got up to around 20%, although it seems to have flattened out over the past 20 years. And, but at the same time, the number of PhDs, people um, going on PhDs in physics, has been climbing steadily as well and hopefully continues to rise towards towards 50. What's the, what's the call, Lillian? Do you think, have we officially run out of seats? I think so. Does anyone have an empty seat next to them? <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this, we will set up a video overflow room. If you, so if you don't mind standing for a little bit, it might take 10 minutes or so to hook us up. Oops. Yeah, so, okay, so this is the next thing. So, uh, so, any questions before we go? Otherwise, we're going to go on to Chapter 9 stuff. So things are rotating. And uh, in particular, what we want to do is talk about rotational kinematics. So if you take, if you were to look down upon a rotating circle, and it's rotating this way, for example, and you look at different points, like, for example, this uh, orange piece of tape or the yellow piece of tape, you see that they're moving, they have a velocity, the velocity is constantly changing, and also, at any particular instant, the velocity is different for the different points on, on the disk. And uh, if you look at what is sort of the same, if you take a, a line and draw it through the center, and then look at some time later, the coins that are on a line will stay on a line. So any object or any point on this rotating object that is along a radial line will stay on that radial line, meaning that it sort of goes further as it gets further away from the center in the same amount of time. So things are going faster as they get towards the edge, which sort of makes sense if you look at the very, very center, it's just staying perfectly still, but just turning. But out here, things are going faster. And it just goes linearly up as you go towards the edge. Okay. So there are similarities. Uh, Lillian's going to fuss around with all my technology as we go. Uh, between the motions of different points on a, on a rotating rigid body. So during a particular time interval, all coins at different points turn through the same angle delta theta. So that is a hint that perhaps angles is the way we should be describing rotational motion. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So 
How do we do angles? Well, we go to what's called polar coordinates. Um, in here you have, uh, like say we have a particle right here. You can describe it in terms of its x, y coordinates and do x velocity and y velocity. Or you can use what's called polar coordinates, which means you have a distance r from the center and you have an angle which is the angle between the x-axis and the, that radius vector, the r that connects the origin out to the particle. And so if it's a, if it's a rotating object and the center, uh, the origin is the rotation axis, then the nice thing is that r is constant and what we're doing is we're keeping track of the rate of change of theta. And so then we have arc length, which is the distance that it travels. And that's going to be important if we're going to relate the linear motion to angular motion. And we have uh, s equals r times theta. That does work as long as you measure theta in radians. So that's an important thing for this chapter, which might be the first time we have to do that, is a lot of, sometimes for these equations, and actually for the next chapters as well, for simple harmonic motion, you have to set your calculator to radians mode, so hopefully you know how to do that. But, but basically, yeah, theta is going to be an angle in radians, and then if you keep track of the time interval and divide by theta, delta theta by delta t, you get uh, radians per second. So I'll just write that down. You've got the, this is an, a Greek letter omega. It looks like a W, but it's not really a, a W. It's, it's the last letter, letter of the Greek alphabet. That can come up sometimes in mastering physics if, if you, there's a symbolic answer and you have to type out um, something with an omega in it. If you type a W, it just tells you that's wrong. It doesn't tell you why, but because you have to select the pull down menu and find the Greek letter omega and the units of this one are the units of theta, which is radians, uh, and then divide it by uh, the units of time, which is seconds. So SI units, or SI, I guess. Sometimes you see omega measured in uh, RPM, rotations per minute or something, where the rotations or revolutions is the number of full times around it goes per second, if you look at an engine or something. But you can convert that pretty easily. We'll, we'll give an example of converting that uh, to radians per second. And then there's sort of a limit here if you want to think about the, the calculus of it. OK. So let's see if we can do a, mastering, or a learning catalytics question. To deliver to your device. A carnival Ferris wheel <clears throat> ha uh, has some seats uh, that are located halfway between the center and the outside rim. So compared with the seats in the outer rim, the inner cars, like this one that's circled with the blue circle, has smaller angular speed and greater tangential speed, greater angular speed and smaller tangential speed. Here we're comparing this angular speed omega in radians per second to the, the old-fashioned tangential speed in meters per second. So I'll let you think about that, discuss that. Hopefully you can click in. I'm going to give you a minute. Okay. Yeah, so the answer that I like is C. So, so what I think is going on is that at all points, have the same omega on what's called rigid body ro uh, rotation. Okay, it's not um, it's not deforming or something like that or changing its shape. Uh, like a galaxy, for example, does not have this particular property because it's made up of a whole lot of different particles going at different omega. But an object like a like a carnival Ferris wheel. All points have omega, but then you have the tangential velocity is equal to r times omega. So as r increases, then the tangential velocity increases. We can read that's an, an r. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So rigid body rotation, uh, angular velocity omega uh, is the rate of change of angular position, theta. Uh, the units are radians per second. And then the next thing is, in kinematics, is that if the rotation speed is speeding up or slow, is changing, then the, there's angular acceleration. And there's a new letter for that, which is this Greek letter alpha. Yeah, you can do that. Let's uh, just take a brief, brief moment to, to think about that. I'm just identifying the Greek letter here, which is called alpha. It looks like an A, or curly A. Um, and that one has units radians per second squared. So all points on a rotating rigid body have the same omega and the same alpha. Okay. And what's interesting about this point right here <laughs> so this point actually has two components to its, its acceleration. It has a radial acceleration, which still does equal um, A sub R. It's just equal to V tangential squared divided by R. But now it has this A sub T, which is equal to R times alpha. Okay, which is, for uniform circular motion, that alpha is zero and the uh, A sub T is zero. But for any circular motion, any time a particle is moving on a circular path, it always has this uh, V squared over R to keep it on that path. That's one of the, it's at least a component of its acceleration. Did you find a clip for that microphone yet? <laughs> All right. So I like to think of things in terms of graphs. If you make a graph of theta versus time, um, let's say we're doing, for example, this, uh, this orange piece of tape. And it starts at theta equals 0. So if this is the x-axis and this is the origin, it starts at x equals or at, I guess, theta equals 0. And then it starts going up creating this angle between its own radius vector and the x-axis. So it starts gradually, goes up for a while, then slows down, and then stops. That's this whole motion shown here. And if you take the, the derivative of that, or the, um, the slope, the slope of that graph gives you this graph, which means that the, that omega vector increases a little bit, and then slows down. And it gives some tangential velocity that increases and then goes back down to zero. And then the slope of the omega versus t graph is this new thing, alpha, in radians per second squared. And the tangential acceleration, again, is just alpha times r. So you just, in all these cases, you take that radians thing, times it by the r, and you get back to meters, or, or meters per second, or meters per second squared. Okay. Great. Okay. And then there's these historical conventions, so about uh, positive or negative. Um, so the way it worked again was that counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. And that comes from theta being measured off the x-axis as it is. Did you find a clip? Perfect. Thank you. So. Uh, when you look at omega, omega tells you which way uh, the object is rotating. And alpha uh, tells you if it's speeding up or slowing down. In the sense that if alpha has the same sign as omega, it's speeding up. If alpha has the opposite sign of omega, it's slowing down. It's kind of, there's sort of an analogy here to um, linear motion. Do you remember if something, for example, is moving to the right and accelerating to the right, then it's speeding up. So if it's got positive uh, velocity and positive acceleration, it's speeding up. And if it has positive velocity and negative acceleration, it's slowing down. But you can also imagine if it's going to the left, it has negative velocity. If that has negative velocity and negative acceleration, it's actually speeding up. 
And if it has negative velocity and positive acceleration, then it's slowing down. And it's the exact same thing that's going on here at the clockwise and the counterclockwise. And I'm going to give you a little test on this, see if you can do it. I'm learning catalytics. So here we have a fan blade. We are told by these arrows which way it's turning. <laughs> I have become a supreme man. <laughs> it's only got some serious reverb going from the next one. Okay. <laughs> I feel like Apollo or something. All right. Um, so the arrows indicate that direction that it actually is rotating, and then you're given this information that the fan blade is speeding up. So what are the signs of omega and alpha? Give you some chance to talk about that. Give me a minute. Okay, right. So I got D. Basically, it's going clockwise. And so by our historical uh, definition, historical convention, since clockwise is negative, that means omega is negative. So it's one of these two. And then it says that it's speeding up. So speeding up means that alpha and omega have the same sign. So in order for this to happen, you have to have alpha and omega negative. Let's do another quick one in a minute. Okay, you guys are becoming experts at rotational kinematics. I also got B as well. Here it's going clockwise, slowing down, so that you need an uh, opposite sign. So in this case also alpha is negative. So next what I want to do is draw your attention to an analogy that comes up again and again in chapter 9, which is analogizing uh, what we've already become very comfortable with in linear terms to uh, now rotational terms. First example is, uh, well, I, I guess on the left-hand side I'll do the linear. So we know that x specifies position, units are meters. If you take the slope of an x versus time graph, you get velocity. And that's in meters per second. And if you take the slope of velocity versus time graph, you get acceleration in meters per second squared. So the analogy we're drawing here is that if you have the angular position of an object in radians and plot that versus time, you take the slope of that graph, you're going to get angular velocity in radians per second. So that's the analogy there. And then if you take the that angular velocity and plot it versus time, and take the slope of that, you get this angular acceleration alpha in radians per second squared. So it is stuff that you've already done, but we're just applying it now to a, to a different physical situation. And I'm going to keep drawing analogies like this. It turns out, it's going to turn out amazingly that there's you know, a rotational analogy for force, there's a rotational analogy for energy, there's a rotational analogy for momentum, there's a rotational analogy for kinetic energy, all this stuff. And we're going to deal with all that in the next, either today or, or Wednesday. Oh yeah, this is another thing to talk about. So I've been telling you to keep track of your units. So this is the one time where you don't have to keep track of your units. It's kind of I call radians like the, the magical lucky charms unit in that they can just sort of jump in or jump out of equations and you don't have to explain why. They just get there. And I think it's because a radian is dimensionless. It doesn't have dimensions of length or something. What it is, it's really it's a ratio between arc length and radius. So um, meters over meters gives you uh, nothing. So example, let's say we were to take this is a correct equation a good equation. So let's check the units, like any good physicist. Well, you can try checking the units. What you get is meters per second on the left, because that's what uh, velocity is, equals radians per second, because that's what uh, omega is, times the radius vector, which is in meters. And it almost works, but you get radians times meters per second. So then what you do is you just cross out the radians. 
And then you, you go like this. Yay! <laughs> you check the, check the units. <laughs> so that's OK. And sometimes also, if you were going the other way, you can just cram the radians back in there. So it's usually not OK to just throw units in or out of an equation unless they're a dimensionless unit of radians. Fair enough? So speaking of analogies, look at this chart. This gets really crazy, and we're going to solve some, some problems using rotational kinematics. So basically, I don't know if you remember this, but we had V is V0 plus A times T. We had X is X plus V0T plus 1 half AT squared, all that stuff. Well, all those same equations work in Greek, okay, where you just, anytime you see a V, change it to an omega. Anytime you see an A, just change it to an alpha. T's remain as T's, uh, X's all go to thetas, and all those same equations beautifully work. So I can give you an example of that. There it is. Let's say we have a bicycle wheel that has an initial velocity of 1.5 radians per second. So I can sketch a wheel and it has some center. And we say initial angular velocity omega 0 is equal to 1.5 radians per second. And a constant angular acceleration alpha is equal to 0 0.2 radians per second squared. Through what angle, so if it's going up like this, through what angle, uh, theta I guess, has the wheel turned between t equals 0 and t equals 2.5 seconds? So we've got t is equal to 2.5 seconds, um, uh, t equals 0, um, theta equals 0, we'll assume this. That's sort of our assumptions. Um, and we need theta when t is equal to 2.5 seconds. So can we do it? Well, let's um, use the age sheet, which we have, let's see here. We have things like alpha, we have alpha, we have omega sub zero, we have t, and we need theta. So we need an equation that has all these things, and um, we don't care about um, omega, like the final omega. So I don't think, I think the one that we want to use is actually this one. This is the one where it doesn't seem to have anything about the final angular speed, which is what we don't care about. So I'm just going to take that from the aid sheet. We're going to use that theta is equal to theta 0 plus omega 0 t plus 1 half alpha times t squared. And what I get is, I guess we're down at the solve and evaluate step here, is that theta equals 0 plus 1.5 times 2.5 uh, plus 1 half of 0 0.2 times 2.5 squared. And I've used SI units for all these things, and I get uh, 3.75 plus 0 0.625. I got theta is equal to uh, 4.37. Does anyone really know the units? Just use radians. Yeah, exactly. So it's the, it's the SI unit for for angles, so just put radians. And I would just say that um, I think around six radians is a full circle. So uh, this is less than that, than a full circle. That's where I'm going with that. So. It's very similar to doing these old um, kinematics, constant acceleration, except it's, it's Greek letters here and there. Okay. Time is it? 5.40. Okay. So I'm going to switch back, and I will scan this after class today. 
Sorry I go a little fast with these things. It's good. Last thing I want to say is something about rolling without skidding constraints. So when a round object rolls without skidding, um, we know that the distance that the axis of the center of mass travels is equal to, I guess, that arc length that goes along the edge of the wheel. So the distance s is equal to theta times r. That's now the distance that the center moves. And so, again, you take the slope of that, you get the speed is equal to omega times r, and the acceleration is equal to alpha times r. So this does come up sometimes in kinematics equations. You're asked to talk about something that's rolling and what its speeds are, and you have to use these equations sometimes. This is usually the one that comes up a lot. And you've got some Newton's laws. It also comes up with pulleys, and we'll talk about that in the second hour. Okay. Yeah, so this is uh, about rotational inertia. And I have a demonstration, which hopefully you can see from the other video room. But it's, what it is, is that it is a stick that's on a uh, fairly frictionless axle. And at the ends of the stick, there are these brass masses. And I can kind of push it around. I can try to slow it down and turn it around to the other direction. I can try to move it or rotate it by giving it some external forces. And I can try to slow it down. And it, it tends to want to keep going. Even if I, if I really get it spinning, it takes kind of a lot of work to get it to slow down. That's with the brass masses located as far from uh, the center as they can. If I put the brass masses closer to the center and tighten them, like that, then all of a sudden it becomes very easy to rotate it and to change its rotation. I just hit it with this pencil and just flip it around because all the mass is towards the center. All I'm doing is just kind of rotating the outer part. Something has definitely changed about this system. The mass is exactly the same, but this is very easy to rotate and when I put these way out, it suddenly becomes very difficult to rotate. Or not very difficult, but a lot more difficult. It wants to keep going. And to slow it down is hard, and to speed it up is also harder. I have to put a lot more force into it. See what's happening? And it's, it's on the, the um, overhead. If you take this dumbbell and put them close to the center of rotation, most of the mass close to the center, it's easy to rotate. If uh, you put the mass far from the center, it's more difficult to rotate. So this is the concept of rotational inertia. It has a number in physics. Um, there's a whole analogy and everything we'll get into. There's an equation. So when we get to uh, compute a number, what you do is you consider a body like these, this body. Maybe there's two masses there. It consists of a whole bunch of particles all labeled with mass m sub i. Uh, and each particle is located at a distance r sub i from the rotation axis. If you want to compute this rotational inertia, it comes out in units of kilograms times meters squared, and you just add up m1 r1 squared plus m2 times r2 squared plus m3 times r3 squared, and uh, just sum those all up. The units are of rotational inertia are kilograms times meters squared. And an object's rotational inertia depends on its axis of rotation. So this was similar, I think I remember you, I asked you about a ladder leaning against the wall and I said, what's the torque from the wall? And then it turned out it, de it depended on the rotation axis. It's sort of a trick question. Same thing happens for rotational inertia. It's possible to have a, a different rotational inertia depending on different rotation axes. Like me, for example, I am an object. I have some rotational inertia, maybe around a vertical axis. If I go like this, I have some rotational inertia. If I rotate around a different axis, like this axis, if I'm like my feet, and I do a cartwheel, I have a different rotational inertia, even though I'm sort of the same shape and same mass. Try a, a question based on this. So I'm going to have to put this equation on here because this one does take a little bit of work to figure it out. A couple of minutes here. Feel free to discuss this. You've got two dumbbells. One of them is uh, made of 
two one m masses, maybe one kilogram masses, located this distance r from each other, rotating around the center. This one is rotating around the center. It's twice as long, but the masses are half as much. So which one of these has the larger rotational inertia? Or are they both the same? OK, so a lot of people are saying dumbbell B. How does that work? So to me, this is not at all obvious. So I think what I'm going to do is just try to work it out. So I A, so if this is the rotation axis right here, it's going to be m times this distance r over 2 squared plus the other one, m times r over 2 squared. So I think it's going to be 2 times r squared over 4 uh, times m. So it's going to be uh, m r squared over 2. Make sense? How do I got that? And then IB is going to be uh, m over 2 times this one's now r squared plus m over 2 times r squared. Again, and I just get m times r squared, which I think is greater than I sub a. It's about twice as much. Okay, so the masses are half as small, but they're twice as far from the rotation axis, and it's the distance from the rotation axis uh, squared that contributes to the rotational inertia. So if you double that, you, you go up by a factor of four, and, and more than compensates for the decrease in mass. Yes? Um, are we dividing it by two to, to measure the distance from the center? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So that's right. All these little r's are measured from the, the axis of rotation. And it's specified in the problem uh, that the, it says about the midpoint of the rod. So it's kind of in the, uh, you're supposed to read into that that the rotation axis is the midpoint of the rod. That's a, that's a good point. It doesn't really say it, but I think that this means this is the rotation axis. Okay, <laughs> what time are we at here? 550, okay, we're doing pretty well. Um, so another thing that comes up, so if this was a calculus-based course, you can do all these computations of shapes. But what we're going to do in this course is look at particular shapes like uh, that someone else has already done the integral. So if you have a thin ring or a hollow cylinder that has some radius, capital R, and some total mass, M, then it turns out that the rotational inertia of that is just simply M times R squared. Seems simple enough. But if it's a different shape, like this shape, here you have uh, a thin rod that is rotating about its midpoint, and it has its mass, M, spread out all over this whole thing. So some of it's right towards the center, some of it's at the edges. Turns out that the rotational inertia of that, like this kind of thing, is uh, 1 12th times m times l squared. And then if you rotate it around the end like this, it's more. It's 1 third. It's four times as much. It's kind of weird. Uh, a disk, solid disk, if you fill in the center, you get 1 half mr squared. A solid sphere, like a bowling ball, for example. This should say a capital R there. Why it says lowercase r. If the total radius is r, then it's 2 fifths mr squared. And if it's a hollow spherical shell, like a ping pong ball, for example, then you get 2 thirds mr squared. So some questions I sometimes get from students. Will the rotational inertias of simple objects table be given on the test? Yes. If you need it, I'll just put it there so you don't have to write those on your H sheet. And another interesting question I got from a student, which was, why does the hollow sphere, which is lighter than a filled sphere, have a greater rotational inertia? Is that right? Is two, two thirds is actually bigger than two fifths, right? Anyone have any ideas about that? 
I think more stuff should be harder to rotate, right? Yes? So because the mass is um, constant, like for a hollow object, the mass is concentrated all on the furthermost part of yeah. the radius, while the solid field, the mass is concentrated yeah. Yeah, kind of. So, so I think what the flaw in the reasoning here is that, so, th so it's not true. There, there's an assumption that these both have the same mass. So if you take a bowling ball and you scoop out all the middle of it and take it away and make it into a hollow shell, it'll have a much lower mass, right? And so it will have a much lower rotational inertia. This is comparing two objects that have the same mass somehow. So. Uh, if you take the same material and just cut it the middle, certainly the rotational inertia, just like its mass, goes way, way down. Because rotational inertia is just the sum of the m times r squareds for all the particles. It's as simple as that. But if the mass is the same, as you say, then this hollow shell has more of its mass sort of concentrated far away from the rotational axis. I don't know how you would do that. Maybe the hollow shell will be made of metal. And the filled shell, a filled disk solid sphere would be made of wood or something, something with a different uh, density. Does that make sense? You keep that somehow the same radius, same mass, but have a different shape. And then you would get that the, the hollow shell would have a greater rotational inertia. Okay, I'm getting close to the break here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is this next one gave my con hall people a lot of. Grief, but let's do it as a learning catalytic, see what you see. Let's, you may have to discuss this. Rotational inertia I, as we've been discussing, is A, the rotational anal analog of kinetic energy, B, the rotational analog of mass, C, the rotational analog of momentum, or D, the tendency for anything that is rotating to continue rotating. Please discuss with your neighbor, choose the best answer of those four. See what you think. Um, I'll give you a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one got this in Con Hall either, so. I don't know. So, where I'm getting at is this whole analogy chart, which we're going to get into a little more in the next lecture, um, which is that if you think of the rotational analog of force as being torque, and then you think of like acceleration as force divided by mass, it's going to turn out that angular acceleration is torque divided by this rotational inertia. That's where it comes up a lot. We can also try to um, do a little computation before we break. We've got a couple more minutes. Let's see if we can do this one here. Did I turn it off? Let's try again. Should be switching. Try again. Say a little prayer. So, let's say we have uh, four small metal spheres, each with mass 0.2 kilograms, and they're arranged in a square that's 0.4 meters on a side. Find the rotational inertia about an axis through the center of the square perpendicular to its plane. So it's going to be rotating kind of like, like this. Make sense? Sort of around this axis that comes up at you. So uh, we're going to use that I is equal to the sum of M sub I times R sub I squared. So we're going to have to number these things, one, two, three, and four. And we're going to have to sort of try to draw a simplifying diagram here. If this is the rotation axis, and this is particle 1, then from here to here is 0 0.4 meters. So from here to here is 0 0.2 and 0 0.2. And this is R1. This is R2. I think they're actually all, there's another one down here, another one down here, all four masses uh, contribute the same to I. So I is going to be equal to M1 times R1 uh, squared plus M2 times R2 squared plus da da da. It's going to be 4 times M times R squared. And also from Pythagoras, you get that R squared is equal to 
0 0.2 squared plus 0 0.2 squared because of this right angle, just from the geometry there. which is, I did that on my calculator and I got 0 0.08 meters squared. So you get I is equal to 4 times 0 0.2 kilograms times 0 0.08 meters squared and you get I is equal to 0 0.064 kilograms times meters squared. One other quick one I want to do, if we can push that to the side a little bit, is what if you have the exact same object, but now you rotate it around a horizontal axis? Well, we can do the same thing, call one, two, three, four, and we can try to look at it this way. Now you see things going this way, so that this distance, R1, is equal to 0 0.2 meters. And here, R2 is equal to 0 0.2 meters. And so once again, and I think these ones will be the same, all four masses contribute the same. But now the distances are different. So I is equal to 4 times M times R squared. But now you just get 4 times 0 0.2 kilograms times 0 0.2 meters uh, squared. And you get I is equal to 0 0.032 kilograms times meters squared. So what's interesting here, if you compare it to the other one, is you get this is half now of I for the perpendicular axis. Okay? And that's because the masses are closer, they're actually root 2, closer to the axis. So that kind of makes sense.